All right. Hello, everyone. Good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are, and welcome to the after show for the Lindors Abbey Rapid Challenge. We had the second day of uh, semifinal action, and we now know who one of the finalists will be, and it is not Magnus Carlsen, but the winner of today, uh, and who is going to move on to the um, finals, is Daniel Dubov, who ends up with a convincing victory, uh, two and a half to half today against Dingley Wren, and so he is moving on already to uh, the final, while Magnus has to come back and fight it out tomorrow against Hikaru Nakamura. Hikaru, who came back with a big win today, uh, winning two and a half to one and a half, playing solid chess in the last three games after a crazy first one that could have gone either way, but did go Hikaru's way, and after that, uh, he did play well to uh, stem Magnus' comeback. And so, um, as has happened uh, in the past, uh, these guys are, are, are really having a, a tough go at it. Uh, Hikaru extremely strong in all of these rapid time controls, extremely strong online. And he is giving Magnus a run for his money again to, uh, in, this, in this match. Um, let me show you the bracket here, just so you can see uh, that Daniel Dubov has advanced to the final. And we will see if he will face his uh, teammate, Magnus Carlsen. As we know, they have worked together. Dubov, very aggressive, uh, very well-versed in opening theory. Uh, he showed that today in some really fascinating chess today. Actually, we're going to go through in just a minute here. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, is he going to face Magnus Carlsen or will he face Hikaru Nakamura? Uh, in a way, you're almost, uh, you're almost rooting for Nakamura to, to sort of see something different here. Uh, it would be, a, a, of course, in both cases, a very interesting final. Uh, speaking of Hikaru Nakamura, he is one of several American players who have had a lot of success in the last several years. And as we talk about our hashtag Heritage Chess during this Lindors Abbey uh, Rapid Challenge, uh, there was an article today uh, published on American Chess uh, that features the likes of Hikaru Nakamura, Wesley So, Fabiano Caruana, um, but also talks about some of the previous generation, people like Gata Kemsky more recently, but then going all the way back to uh, Paul Morphy, um, uh, Paulson, and uh, Pillsbury, guys like that. Um, so you should read this article. It is pretty interesting. I did want to uh, pinpoint one particular paragraph here, which I thought was pretty cool. This is, this is uh, keep in mind, this was written in 1898. So just at the, uh, at the end of the 19th century here. Um, and it talks about bullet chess, which I didn't even realize was, ba was a thing, you know, back in that, in those times. So it says, continuous tournaments and rapid games of one minute per move have been lately in great favor in America. They have not yet caught on much in Europe, and we hope the latter kind never will do so. For though they may be very amusing and may promote a quick sight of the board, they are more of the nature of Skittles than of solid and thoughtful chess, and we should think would be a very poor preparation for contests of any real importance. This is coming from uh, written in 1898 in uh, British Chess Magazine. So um, contrast that with what the kids are doing today. We have uh, Hikaru Nakamura, Ali Reza Faruja, Magnus Carlsen are, are all spending countless hours uh, playing bullet chess. They have done so for their entire career and they are all shining and be, you know, have managed to become uh, whether it's because or in spite of this, they have become incredibly strong. And so that is that is pretty interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, I thought it was kind of fascinating that they wrote about one minute chess, uh, you know, all the way back in 1898 when, you know, if you, you remember, uh, a lot of games back in those days were played without a chess clock at all. Um, so yeah. Uh, we are going to move on now to the chess. And as always, you know, feel free to ask questions. Uh, I especially pay attention to the chess 24 chat. Um, so if you are in there, you know, hit me up, make comments, ask questions, whatever you like. I will try to, uh, I will try to answer them. Even if they're not directly about today's match, I, you know, I try to answer them once to the extent that I can. Um, so let's go through the chess. Uh, we're actually going to start, I think we're going to start with uh, Daniel Dubov's first game here because uh, it really set the tone for the day and, and features, you know, an amazing little puzzle-like uh, finish, which is worth, which is worth seeing. 
Uh, but really, there was exciting chess in both matches today. We often start with Magnus, so today we'll start with, uh, with Dubov. Um, so Dubov plays with the black pieces in this game. Um, he's someone with a you know, somewhat, somewhat diverse repertoire uh, with black and with white, but he's, and he's very, very sharp. So here they, pl they get into uh, sort of a, uh, a Reti you know, hybrid Catalan slash Reti opening where black takes on c4 quickly. Um, and sometimes black tries to hang on to this pawn for a long time, sometimes they don't. Uh, but in this case, they play this bishop e6 variation. Um, there's theory with both knight e5 and knight g5 here. Knight g5 uh, is also possible. Um, but I think uh, the move that, that Ding plays is actually uh, more testing. He plays knight to e5. And now Dubov, as he does so in many openings, uh, doesn't doesn't disappoint us here and plays h5. This has been played before, um, so it's not like a novelty or anything like that. And it does make some logical sense. Black hasn't you know decided where they're going to put their king yet, and the white knight has left the king side, so leaving the king, the white king, a little bit uh, more exposed than it would be you know otherwise. So it does it does certainly make make some logical sense to play this. Um, Ah, actually, Fuxia, Fuxia is making an interesting point that I misread the text. The text does say one minute per move, which one minute per move is rapid and not quite. It's not one minute per game. That makes a lot more sense. You see, I, sometimes I read too fast. So it makes a lot. I was shocked that they would actually play one minute chess. Uh, but this is one minute per move, which is, I guess that still is funny because that means they were seeing that as incredibly fast when in reality, uh, it's not all that fast compared to what they're doing today. So things have changed after all. Makes more sense. Knight takes c4, knight takes, knight takes, h4. All of this has been played. Uh, it is possible if you're wondering, you know, should white stop this and play h4? You know, it's 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 playable as well. The problem is I think um, on this move, I think queen d4 becomes uh, possible again. And after knight f3, we can just go back or maybe go queen d6. Um, I do wonder about the move h4, though. I think it has also been played a few times. Uh, there's also this idea, which sometimes uh, sometimes is playable once h5, h4 plays, and I guess white would take the pawn. This would this could be interesting. I wonder if Dubov would try something like this, sort of a wild uh, wild idea. But so after knight takes c4, knight takes knight takes h4. Uh, Ding Li Ren plays knight e5, reasonable move. Hg hg queen c8. Queen c8 is actually I think the novelty in this game. Uh, there was, there was, uh, I saw some other move having been played here, and I don't remember. I didn't note what it was, but it might have been g6 right away. But queen c8 is very crude. Reminds me of, um, reminds me of uh, of some of these uh, some of these quick h5, h4 that you that people play in bullet with queen c8, bishop h3. Hikaru used to play this stuff, uh, but here in particular, especially for this time control, it makes a lot of sense. It's not entirely obvious. You know um, how white's going to improve the defense of their king. So he plays rook d1. Makes sense. You don't want to be forced to trade the bishop. So on bishop h3, is able to play bishop f3. And now Dubov just plays g6. So it's not like black is necessarily going to get um, a crazy attack here. On the other hand, you know the black position is solid. There's nothing that says that black can't eventually play uh, play bishop g7 in castle and have a fairly solid position. So black could go sort of in both directions here. Um, Ding Li Ren plays b4, very logical. He's putting a bishop, you know, on the long diagonal to oppose the black one. And Dubov plays king f8, which is uh, which is another thing that you can do if you want to uh, say that your rook on h8 is better. You call that sort of an artificial castling where the king can get away from the center square, um, but uh, but leave the rook on the open file. Um, White plays a4. I do wonder if maybe he could have considered uh, D immediate B5. When you look at the rest of the game, it seems like maybe a, a more uh, direct uh, plan would have been better. For example, CB, Queen B3, you're attacking this one and this one. Uh, so you gain the pawn back. Black might play, um, I don't know, Queen to E6. Um, and then we can either take on B5 or maybe even try to take on B7. But they're both possible. I think white might be a little bit better here. It seems to me like this... Um, you know, unless black finds a very crude way of attacking as he does in the game, but here, here it's not going to work with the, the setup like this. Um, 
you know, white should be a little better. So I think b5 would have been an interesting move. Um, uh, Ding Li Ren plays a4, and Duboff goes for this maneuver knight h7. And I, I bet that Ding was not expecting knight h7, uh, because it is a somewhat unnatural maneuver, and it doesn't seem to threaten anything really that quickly. Um, and this is where Ding missed uh, missed the thread, like sort of lost the thread here. Um, although it was not so easy, he did have a move, and it helps. Let's go through the game first. Um, and yeah, someone in the chat, Super Passer, is saying that uh, Capablanca uh, enjoyed playing at a very fast pace, like 10 seconds per move. Yeah, Capablanca, I don't know the exact time control, but... It was known that Capablanca really enjoyed playing Blitz, and he was very strong in Blitz. Um, and in fact, I think you know Blitz chess was extremely popular in Cuba, um, possibly because of him. And uh, yeah, but he was known to be a very talented player, uh, and often the, the the very talented players uh, are very very good in Blitz. Um, what we call talent, anyway. Who knows what it is versus you know having worked hard and so on. But um, so here, yeah, so after b5, knight g5, which is the idea, um, here Ding missed missed the uh, the rather rather tricky point that Daniel Dubov had here. And he just plays b takes c6. And now this loses, and it's sort of uh it's sort of nice. I mean, some of you may have already seen the game. Uh and uh so I won't wait too long, but it, I'll give you here like just 10 seconds to look at the position. There is a very nice combination here. So he plays bishop takes e5, forces bishop takes back, knight takes f3, pawn takes f3. And now I bet Ding was, you know, had calculated something like this where, I right, sorry, not this, but maybe a rook move or I don't know what he missed here because the, the thing is that Dubov would probably not go for, well, he I'm sure he saw it in this position, but he would not go for leaving the pawn on c6 hanging unless he had a point, right? So you wonder... If sort of the the sense of danger uh, left uh, left Ding here, because maybe he still had a chance to play something like this, you know, with threats of of, of checks here, um, and I'm not sure how good his position is, but it's not. It maybe is not. You know, now he'll be able to keep, take on f3 with the queen if needed, and so he's not going to get checkmated so fast. And on bishop e5, now we can play queen takes e5 because the rook is hanging in the back. So it's not totally totally obvious. Um, but so here after bc6, bishop e5, bishop e5, knight takes f3, pawn takes f3, and the beautiful bishop g2. You see this kind of move in the puzzle books. Um, the first threat is to play rook h1, king takes g2, queen h3 mate. And then the other threat, uh, which is very common, is to play bishop takes f3, which with an unstoppable um, queen h, uh, sorry, rook h1. And, and on bishop takes rook, then we can play queen to h3, and the queen comes to h1. So um, this is just completely over, amazingly. 20 moves, it's checkmate. Um, there's not, oh, one, one final one, I guess, g4, bishop takes f3 with rook h1, or with queen takes g4. Um, yeah, so on, like, bishop takes h8, this queen takes g4. So, um, yeah, so it's pretty... Uh, it's pretty amazing. So let's go back a few moves and see could could uh, could White have done anything. So I think the spot before uh, before B five is probably the, the the moment where there was Queen C five and you're still preparing to play B five at some point if you can. And the idea is that on Knight G G five now we have this check and the Queen will capture this right. So um, so this stops Knight G five. And then black could make a move like bishop f6, sort of a natural move, gives a square to the king and, and prepares knight g5. Uh, but it seems like the position is not, not all that clear here. There's different, there was different ideas that I looked at here. I think one of them, one of them is that you can bring the queen back to e3, uh, which at least will protect the bishop. Might still be a decent position for black. And then the, the computer suggests all sorts of other things like, you know, uh, a crazy move like this. With the idea that if you play knight g5, we can play f4. Um, actually, no, knight g5, there's still this move, knight takes g6. And there's complications again, but um, here the idea is that this is pinned. So um, so that's another point. So there's there were moves for Ding still here. So he just, uh, his sense of danger just kind of escaped him. And you see how dangerous uh, Duboff is. But this bishop g2, this bishop g2 uh, 
final position is uh, is worth uh, worth you know a place in some puzzle books, and so it's always nice to see that happen in in games here. So moving on to game two, uh, in um, <clears throat> so game two was a uh, a Catalan, and Duboff played this move h4, and this move was really interesting. Um, the <laughs> And I don't think I think this one has actually not been played before. So two games, two sort of uh, early H pawns. Uh, what move was it in the other game? It was on move eight. So both both times on move eight, uh, Dubov pushes his H pawn forward. Uh, but in this case, it's it's a uh, it's a bit more uh, it's a bit more murky to explain because this is a very theoretical position. Uh, and you know normally White just castles, plays you know Bishop F4 and either Knight D2 or Knight C3. Uh, prepares to play e4. So in this case, uh, he's going for for a different plan. But Dubov does like to play these lines where you allow Black to take on c4 without recapturing. You play like e4, e5, and um, so in that sense, you know it's clear that he's going for one of those plans. And so after knight d7, normal move, knight c3, he's happy to sacrifice this pawn, and that's sort of his whole idea. Uh, so he plays knight e5 here. Um, so b5, not the only move. You could certainly try, you know, one of one of really many moves here, whether it's, uh, you know, rookie eight, h6, I don't know. You could try almost any any possible move. But b5 is very principled, and Dingley Ren does play very princi principled moves in, in general. He tries to uh, He tries to play the move that he feels is right, even if it seems a little bit risky or could potentially fall into the preparation. So here, um, Duboff was prepared, plays knight to e5. Um, Knight takes e5, pawn takes knight d5 is the logical follow-up. It's otherwise it was hard to defend the c6 pawn. Knight e4. And this is an interesting moment where Ding Ding plays f5. And f5 is a, a pretty significant concession that basically says, okay, you're you're definitely gonna have uh, reasonable compensation for the pawn, but I think you know this is the way I keep my position together without getting checkmated. So the computer um, likes playing the move h6. You know, of course, White White White's idea here, and this is kind of the point of H4, is to play Knight G5 and uh, threaten you know the crude, but but not so easy to stop. Um, Queen takes H7. Now you don't usually want to play G6 because uh, whether it's right now or after Knight G5, because G6 will allow you know H5 and 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 that sort of weakening of the king side that looks pretty pretty dangerous if not outright bad right so but it's clear that knight g5 is a big threat so now the question is what happens on h6 and um i did take a good look at this position first of all the move you know if you try to be extremely crude and play this i think it just doesn't work that's there's just not enough here you're not you're not going to be able to checkmate so easily the pawn on g5 is hanging so um so it's not knight g5 but the move that i looked at which uh, depending on the engine some some of the engines find this move quicker uh, than others, but I think the the move that Dubov would play is g4, and this is probably what Ding was afraid of because it does look really dangerous. You're playing g5 next, and you know eventually we'll have some ideas with knight f6. Um, we'll have ideas with g5 g6. Um, you know, it's eventually the, we can try to kick this knight with e e2 e4 and this knight is sort of a pillar of the position this looks dangerous i mean it's still playable for 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 black and there are some really complicated lines i looked at like queen c7 and then you know we can play g5 and sacrifice that pawn we get a position like this and it's sort of mayhem uh but it seems like white is certainly has very good play I, especially in practice i think this would be a difficult position uh for black to hold but it was possible uh, Ding plays f5, and after e takes, knight, uh, pawn takes, b3, um, let's say white has ample compensation for the pawn, but it's not it's not like it's over or anything like that. It's still a playable position for both sides. So um, Dubov finally castles, by the way, because there's not, there's not going to be a checkmate attack uh, now that black has played this way. Um, and they reach this, there's this moment where I want to, um, was it this moment? There's, there was one moment I wanted to stop. For some reason my notes didn't save here, so I'm going off memory again. Uh, there was a moment where I thought white could have maybe improved. 
So while queen b2 was a very interesting move, by the way, the idea, um, there's all sorts, of, all sorts of ideas with rook takes d5 and knight takes f6, um, which is why he plays rook b4. And I do think Dubov, there was a there was one position where he might have had a better move. Um, but here, uh, it would have been interesting to see if Dubov would have repeated if he went here, because it doesn't seem so obvious how he escapes. He could go maybe to d3, and maybe that was his point, and try to, to recycle the queen that way. Um, but that would have been interesting. Uh, but instead, um, then goes queen d8, and now uh, he plays rook c2, and that's an interesting little move. In some cases, the queen is going to get recycled to to c1 to defend that bishop. Uh, and this part, Dubov plays very, very well. Queen e8, now knight c5. So he's threatening to take and play e4, or maybe play e4 right away. Um, black plays queen g6, queen c1. Bishop takes c5, rook takes c5. And already this is, now the position is very difficult for black because the uh, the bishop is just a, a, a pretty poor piece. Uh, e4 is in the air. Uh, yeah, so this is this has become this has become a difficult position for black. King f7. Now Dubov finds a very nice uh, a very nice tactical sequence. He plays h5, and the idea of h5 is that if you played e4 right away, then this exchange sacrifice is actually quite good for black. Um, the queen is very active, and the king suddenly seems safe enough. Uh, but he plays h5 first, which is a deflection. The queen get deflect gets deflected from the e4 square. So he takes, um, and now, only now e4. And now, uh, now it seems like Dubov is just about winning. Uh, interesting moment here, though. He played bishop e3, and that seemed to be um, sort of one of these beautiful moves. Uh, and we'll see the point of it. But it is, in hindsight, we'll see that black maybe had an incredible defense. And in that case, you know, uh, the more sort of prosaic approach of playing this way uh, would have just won, I think. I mean, even though black has three pawns, um, it's, uh, it's just, it's just, uh, the king is too weak here. And, uh, yeah, this position is, is very likely to be, uh, totally winning for white. Um, so, but he plays bishop e3, and this had a sort of a deep idea, which after knight takes, rook d7, king e8, now he plays the move queen d2, and it's, it's beautiful, uh, because the idea is that he wants to play queen d6, and it doesn't seem like there's much that black can do. If they play knight g4, queen d6, queen h2, king f1, that's going to be checkmate on e7 soon. Um, there's really very little that black can do. And then Ding, with only a second on his clock, finds the move rook b8. And rook b8, amazingly enough, seems to force the draw. Or at least I couldn't find I couldn't find a win, and I don't I don't think uh, anybody has so far. Uh, and this is this is a, a beautiful position again. Uh, after F E, which is the idea, uh, White has to take the piece. Rook, uh, sorry, C three first. So the queen is forced to defend the rook. There is no better than Queen D six. And uh, because we have to threaten mate, like if we don't threaten mate, then Black will push and they'll actually win. Um, so we have to threaten mate. Now Rook to B one forces bishop f1. If we play uh, king f2, then there's rook b2. It's actually, that's that can be, you can make a draw like this with white too. Uh, but of course, uh, Dubov plays bishop f1, rook takes, king takes, queen f3. And now the question is, is this a perpetual or not? And amazingly, it seems to be, but it is very tricky how you actually do it. So um, king e1 is played and this was the amazing thing here. Instead of playing queen e3, which is the most certainly the most natural, the only way to do it. Um, and someone is saying bishop e3 is sort of over finesse. It, it it's it, it does appear like it is over finesse, and this is something that does happen with Dubov sometimes. It seems like his artist uh, is he wants to be an artist uh, on, on top of being an amazing player. Uh, but you know he does play some amazing games because of it. But yeah, it does seem like ED CD. But you know you could understand how someone might feel like three pawns for for a piece is not so obvious uh, that it's winning. If of course you know we're looking at it with a computer and the computer says that after rook d4 this position is, is like plus plus whatever plus three plus four. Um, 
but you know to a human you see a pawn happening you know on c3 that's coming to c2 and maybe it's it's a little bit scary you know it's not so obvious that this position is completely winning for white you know to the human eye um to the computer it's clear because here you know you have checkmates and it doesn't even matter that this pawn is on c2 but it's you know i'm not sure if to blame him for this one or not especially because to think that this is going to be a perpetual is you know if he got to this his calculation that the, here and he sees you know queen e3 king d1 and he's like my king probably escapes here i mean you know it's it's understandable but the instead of queen e3 there was queen h1 king e2 and queen h5 and this is sort of crazy uh and so now the logical thing is to go up and now amazingly the queen comes back from the back here and these checks will actually lead to a perpetual because normally in these positions you you know if i if i look at this from a distance i'm going to think my king is going this way and i'm going to hide but the the fact is that here it just doesn't work so the pawn on c6 is very important and you can never go to a5 because of queen b5 and you can never go to c5 again because of queen b5 and king d4 and now we have c5 so and we'll take this um so uh, amazingly, yeah, the position after, if you go queen to, uh, queen h1 instead of queen takes e3, you know, keeping the king here doesn't help. Eventually, we have to go to e2, queen h5, and then the only way to make progress, again, is to go this way. Uh, and g4 doesn't help because we just take it, and on king d3, we go back to d1 again, and it's the same thing. Um, not king, actually, king c4 loses to this, and then c2, c1. Um, so, so yeah, pretty amazing, but queen takes e3. Now the king does, uh, we'll see the difference here. Uh, the king manages to escape because he's able to play queen d3. And now there's a lot of checks, but eventually the king does find a hiding spot. Now he's going to h3 and he's hiding. So ding, resign. Um, so pretty amazing game, actually. Fascinating chess from, from both sides, really. Both had some opportunities. Um, the last game I'm not going to cover in too much detail because uh, Dubov did manage to hold. It was a Catalan, uh, more of a traditional Catalan line here. Uh, interesting to me that in this position, Ding played bishop b2. You know, e4 is is uh, sort of the main theory here. And I do wonder what Dubov uh, was intending to play in this position. A ton of theory there. Bishop b2 is a little more quiet. Um, e4... Um, the bishop has less less aggressive intentions on this diagonal. Um, and there was one point that was sort of interesting here. Uh, knight d4 was a rare, you know, very big blunder by, by white uh, that could have been exploited by queen to e5. And it looks like both players missed it. Uh, and in this position, black is already completely winning. They'll take the bishop on b2 when the knight moves. Um, and rook e1 is not good because you get too much material here, of course. Either cd or bishop d4, even bishop a6 is probably the, the technical best. Um, so, yeah, so queen e5 would have been actually a, a huge, uh, a huge basically winning move for, for, for black. Uh, instead, they got this position, and maybe white was a, a tiny bit better in this position, but uh, Duboff managed to hold it, played solidly, nothing really to... Uh, Nothing to say too much about this game. It was uh, it was well well played, you know, well played by both uh, by both sides the rest of the way. Um, this opposite colored bishop end game really doesn't offer any chances for white because uh, because this pawn is so solid that you just have to make sure not to give uh, not to let white queen and so you'll just put a pawn on h5, pawn on on g6, and then keep the king on f7 and nothing will ever happen. Um, Ding makes some moves only because, you know, that's admitting the match is lost. And so it was a draw. So um, pretty, you know, good match for Dubov. Very impressive that he manages to uh, manages to uh, to beat Ding Li Ren 2-0. Not, not a result that necessarily too many people expected. Um, and so uh, let's move on to our other match. Magnus Carlsen against Hikaru Nakamura. That first game was crazy here. Um, it starts as this Berlin that, that a lot of players have been playing both sides of. Magnus has played both white and black here. Um, I have rather liked the white chances in this line. 
Uh, but I didn't love the white chances in this game. So after uh, castles, bishop g4, h3, bishop h5, um, g4. This has actually been played. Amazingly, Peter uh, Leko, who has been doing our commentary, has had this position with white in the past against Navarro. And um, strong, very strong Czech grandmaster uh, David Navarro. And uh, yeah, here um, knight takes g4 has been played. And... Um, this variation I'm not in love with for white. Um, so I, you know, I think in some of the games here, white uh, waited to castle. They either played knight d2 or, you know, um, didn't castle right away. Um, and even here after h3, bishop h5, there are other moves. You can play a3 first, you can play bishop e3, you can play knight d2 first. Um, but I am not in love with this variation that they get here. Um, and bishop e3, and bishop e7 was preparation for Magnus. In the Leko Navarra game, uh, white played bishop d6. And it is interesting that bishop e7 is the top move by the strongest engines that I could uh, find and that I run. Um, so, you know, interesting preparation. And I wonder, you know, to what extent both were prepared here. Um, king h1, it's possible that king h1 is already a pretty big mistake. Uh, and king g2 might have been, uh, you know, a better try. It's a bit of, in these, uh, in these setups, there's different plans for for white. Essentially, you want to be able to uh, to of course free free your your free yourself from the pin. Uh, knight d2 is another one that that is possible, but on knight d2, I think queen c8 is a little bit annoying um, with the idea of you know either playing bishop h3 and queen g4, which is uh, you know difficult to meet. So king h1 or king g2, but it seems like after king h1 in a game f5. Uh, Already white has a bit of a problem. Uh, and, you know, the, the tactical issue is that they can't take on f5 because of the very strong e4, right? And so this is the point. Uh, and pawn takes e4, queen d1, and now black is going to win a piece and a rook. So that's a lot of material. Um, so um, so f5 is a bit of a, f5 is like a, is a real issue here. Um, and so for that reason, I think this is why maybe king g2 the idea is that now on f5, you could uh, just get out of that. The, the, the knight is protected. So first of all, you might be able to take, although here, I think the computer doesn't like that again with either like castles or rook f8. Um, but you can actually play a weird move like queen e1. And while these, you know, it, it does seem like you need to have looked at this uh, before your end, before you let your king come to f3, it is sort of typical of these positions that you play king g2 and let the king come there. We see this in the Italian and in a lot of these h3 g4 or h6 g5 positions um so that was one thing but after king h1 instead um f5 uh, and you know by the way this is one of the reasons i think why bishop e7 is is better than bishop d6 is because it leaves the pos possibility of playing e4 uh we can't really play knight d2 here because f4 traps the bishop so this is already tough position for for, for white and in fact white is probably already worse uh but Hikaru uh, keeps fighting, plays rook g1, h5, very natural. He defends the bishop and prepares to play f4. Knight c3, f4. And the problem is that here, um, even though white doesn't get you know checkmated right away, uh, this avalanche of pawn uh, is becoming a real you know a real problem, and white doesn't have much counterplay. Um, the rest white's play is actually fairly. Uh, is okay, but there's not there's not much for him to do. The position just wasn't very good. Uh, the computer, by the way, here instead of bishop c5, likes just playing uh, here, bishop c3, taking, and playing uh, either g4 or queen e6, I think, queen e6, and then just castling and playing g4 and rook g8, h4. Computer thinks white is basically almost toast here already, uh, which is fascinating, uh, but. Magnus plays bishop c5, more concrete. He wants to take a third pawn for the piece. Bishop c3, bishop f2, knight d2. White is sort of happy to return some material to try to survive. It's pretty clear that things have gone, you know, very wrong for, for white here. Um, nonetheless, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, still, uh, it's still up to black to sort of find a way to convert. And here, uh, Magnus didn't quite find the, the right path. So he plays bishop f3. That part looks reasonable. And then g4. Uh, g4 might be the beginning, actually, of things not being right. And it's possible that rook g8 first. Uh, and on knight e5, queen to e6. 
it's those are not easy moves to play, right? It's like a, it's a position that requires a lot of accuracy. Um, and here it does seem like maybe black is still on top after say queen h2 castles and then again trying to push these pawns eventually. Uh, but it is a it's a messy position, right? It, things like things here can go very wrong for both sides very quickly. Um, but I, that's why I feel like maybe the position way back where instead of bishop c5, if Magnus had simply taken on, on f3 uh, here and played for queen d7, castles, you know, that plan seemed a little easier for black to play. Um, so in the game, after g4, knight takes e5, rook g8, rook f1, uh, queen g5. Now already, um, already after queen d4, matters are not so clear. White has a, a big threat, of course, of checkmating like this. And so Magnus starts giving checks here and decides to go for it. So, of course, in hindsight, the draw was the right thing to do here. Uh, and he goes g3. And this is a rare, you know, a rare uh, mistake from Magnus, who just was a little overambitious here. Uh, and the, the thing is, Hikaru's next move is forced. So there's no, he only has one move to stop this, really. And so he plays knight f3. By the way, the queen defends d7, right, which was sort of the idea. So knight f3. And now um, the position is actually just bad for black. The king suddenly has, has some problems. And so in the game, Magnus plays g2, which doesn't work out well. What would have happened on, let's say, um, rook to d8? Then simply, you know, white, white can play queen e5, king d7, and queen to f5. And this position, um, even though white, you know, optically, I mean, even though optically black has three pass pawns, they're not really going anywhere here. Um, and so white is probably close to winning here. First, first of all, the big threat is 95 with this. Um, and it's not clear that there's a good way to stop this, right? Like this position is just, it's just starting to be bad. Um, the computer gives it as winning, completely winning for white, in fact. Um, so, so yeah, after, um, after this, you know, Magnus goes for g2. Uh, Hikaru simply plays rook to e1. And uh, um, now Magnus, uh, again, I think underestimated the, the white chances here. He still maybe could try to fight uh, with the move b6. Uh, and apparently this may still be uh, somewhat playable. Although, again, I think white is going to try to uh, to play for a queen trade. And uh, probably has the, the better of it here. So, uh, but he plays queen takes f3. And now he missed uh, something here. Because after queen e5, king d8, queen f6, king e8, bishop b4, um, queen e7 is basically unstoppable. And so he could have just resigned here. He makes a few moves. Uh, c5, bishop c5. Uh, king d7, queen f7, and it's just it's just made in a few moves. For example, queen d8, we can take the rook first uh, and then go back. I mean, even if it wasn't checkmate at this point, white is also just up a ton of material, uh, but it will be made with queen e7, queen e8. So um, rough turn, rough turn of events for for Magnus, and uh, you know from from having a position where here he's probably thinking that the opening has been a huge success the computer gives it as minus two minus three uh, to you know losing to checkmate fairly quickly uh, so it was interesting to see if magnus would come back next game so they they repeat um the scotch game which magnus played in the last uh um in the, their match yesterday uh, but here Magnus plays knight b3. So he doesn't repeat. Yesterday he played this variation with knight c6, queen f6, queen f3. He decided not to test Hikaru's preparation there. And he goes for knight b3, which is an old line it's just, that had some kind of revival. I actually played it a few, you know, some 12 years ago. Um, had some re revival around then. Um, and players have tried to make this structure because structurally it is desirable for white to have this extra space with the pawn on e4 versus the pawn on d6 which normally happens here um the problem is that black black is actually has a lead in development here they castle right away uh and often they get counterplay very fast so it was interesting to see magnus play this queen e2 um and now there's h6 which is one of the moves um and there's the move played in a game which is knight to d4 and knight d4 is a a very critical move because 
uh, it immediately puts pressure against the, the, the center because once, you know, if you take on d4, bishop d4, already there's threats with like bishop c3 and rook e8, you know, sort of asking asking big questions uh, to white. So uh, Magnus plays queen d2. And this has all been played before, so I think not, not a surprise to either of those players. Rook e8, castles, uh, h6, and h4, which is... Uh, you know, somewhat somewhat typical of this variation, we try to, to continue to, to keep the pin and not, not surrender that bishop. C6, and now Magnus took on F6, and I think this was a mistake. Um, I did see some games here, there were, there were games that went bishop C4, and it doesn't seem to me like HG is a threat yet. Uh, and in fact, I was looking, the computer likes to play King B1, a, sort of a, a waiting move. And amazingly, you know, black seems to do okay now we can take because we're, we'll take a pawn, uh, and you know it seems it seems interesting enough, um, and possibly we I think we can also try taking here, and see if the compli the complicate it does get complicated here. So this is sort of for a, for for deeper analysis. But Magnus on c6 uh, decides to take on f6, and after queen takes f6, I don't think that we can really call this an opening success for for. Uh, for white. Uh, and after f3, Hikaru makes a, a very strong move, d5, clearing the position open. And uh, yeah, this just doesn't look right to me from, from the perspective of, of trying to get an opening advantage. King b1. And now um, d4 would have been interesting. I don't know if it's better for black than what he did in the game. Uh, and he chose a more sort of solid way to play. But it seemed interesting. For example, here, uh, bishop c7. And now white can't take on d4 because of rook d8. And we lose the rook on d1. And so after bishop c7, uh, this position looks quite good for black. Um, you know, the, 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 it just seems like the white bishop is not, not especially great. Um, but Hikaru went for a very solid move, played bishop e6. And now this game gets a little bit strange. Uh, Magnus takes on d5 twice and gets a position that I think he can now be reasonably happy with uh, but after uh, but he plays g4 and g4 was sort of a maybe unnecessary uh, you do wonder if he could have played a move like f4 and then g4 and try to try not to sacrifice that pawn but after g4 queen f3 g5 uh, now Hikaru tries to trade queens I'm gonna go a little faster just because I, I have a lot of material to go through um, he gets a position where he his he white is down a pawn but has compensation the opposite colored bishops you know the pawns don't matter as much in the middle game it's more about the king's safety um and he plays g6 fg bishop d3 and um all of these moves i mean there's a lot that we could look at here but it seemed like uh like over here white kind of lost the thread a little bit and black's position became uh solid uh However, Hikaru did make a, a, a mistake here. So black was probably at least equal. And after rook d5, he could play a move like, I think either queen b6 is probably the best. Uh, you could look at other ones too, like, I don't know, maybe, oh yeah, queen g3 is sort of the more, um, the one that you would think Hikaru might want to make, especially after having won the first game. Um, and I think this position is okay for black. It doesn't seem like white can avoid the queen trade. Uh, and so it should be, should be you know, perfectly holdable for, from the black side. Um, but Hikaru plays queen e6 and have to assume this was a blunder. You know, I don't think he would have wanted to give that pawn. Um, because that pawn, even though it wasn't you know, a strong pass pawn or anything, it's, it's still a pawn. And it gave white black the e3 square, you know, things like that. So, uh, of course, the point here being bishop d5. Um, it's possible to me miss moves like this. Uh, you might have just looked at you know bishop e d3 instead. So rook d4, and uh, the next few moves it seems like Hikaru is in a little bit of a panic here, and suddenly White's position is stabilizing. And after queen e3, queen g2, uh, now he's already in trouble. Now g6 is attacked and b7 is attacked. So all these last the last like four moves by Hikaru were suboptimal. Um, but what happens next is pretty unusual. So Magnus takes this pawn, and now they play some moves that are all um, normal. Uh, and we get to uh, a position where Magnus has made a lot of progress. 
I will show you. So they get to this ending and um, this ending is, is already very difficult for black, mostly because the king is weak. This pawn is going to fall at some point. Um, and it's actually probably quite close to winning for, for, for white because eventually these pawns can be very strong. And white can immediately win a pawn. They can win a pawn by playing rook d5, or they can win a pawn by playing rook e5, and then take this one. And it's not easy because the, this black rook can never come out because of rook e8 checkmate, basically. Uh, and so let's say you play rook h2, then the strongest move is actually not to take the pawn right away, although this is possible, but it's to play rook d7 to stop the bishop from coming back. Um, and this position is it's just hard. I mean, I looked at it for a while, and you can also play bishop c7, rook e7 here. And then, you know, the bishop goes somewhere. And then we play the other rook here. And it's just, it looks like this pawn is going to fall. And after that, it's going to be a long, very difficult, you know, eventually white will try to play this. Could be just losing for black, really. Um, but Magnus here makes a, a rare, uh, rare blunder, plays rook d2. And I think his idea was to play rook h2 and eventually take this pawn. Uh, and he thought maybe that's going to be a riskless position. Uh, however, he missed that after rook h1, king a2, rook g1, strong move. The pawn is falling on h5. However, after bishop takes h5, g6, and whoops, the bishop is trapped. No square, right? So um, sort of an amazing miss. And he, instead of taking on h5, he could try a move like rook d6 or rook e6. Um, but now a lot of his advantage is kind of gone is, is kind of gone. Um, he doesn't have a good way to attack this pawn, so it's it's probably closer to equal now. Um, but bishop h5, g6, a surprising miss by the world champion. And now he's actually a little bit lucky that he doesn't really have problems drawing this position. He manages to trade off a pair of rooks, and uh, here he is able to, um, to organize, you know, the king gets to a6, and then he's able to to push a pawn to b to to c5. You know he'll play b4, c4, c5, and b6, and he'll be able to draw. So uh, the game ends in a draw. So a bit of a uh, you know a game that went back and forth, um, and uh, so now it's one and a half to uh, half for Hikaru. And in game three, Hikaru with the white pieces chooses a variation which is extremely solid in the Berlin with. Uh, D takes e5, and this is an old an old line a4, uh, which has been analyzed. And you can try to play this to get a small edge for white, or you can try to play this and, and just make a draw. And Hikaru clearly had the strategy that um, um, that he feels like he's he's got good chances in Armageddon, and so if he gets to two points, he's guaranteed to go at the, in the worst case to Armageddon, and. Uh, and he feels like uh, like he's got probably the edge there, and so he um, he was okay with a draw and saying you know Magnus try to beat me with the white pieces, um, so the game ended in a draw here. So they get to the last game and um, and uh, in this case Magnus played the Italian, so he switched reverted from the Scotch to the Italian. He's also played you know the the, the Rai Lopez, um, and. Hikaru plays, so they get a position, this this uh, a5 move is new but has been played a lot. Uh, they get a theoretical position and Magnus was probably reasonably happy to get this. Uh, here, this has been played, there were a few games, one game for example by Niels uh, Grandelius who has done a lot of commentary here. Um, and it seems like white has some chances for an edge and Magnus here plays bishop e3 which I think might have been a prepared move. Uh, there's been games with bishop d3 and there's been games with this uh, and this is sort of a, a pawn sacrifice, but black gets a lot of counterplay, uh, and so far black has done fairly well from this position. Uh, so bishop e3, you know, sort of an attempt to to, to make this position uh, gain some life. But Hikaru defended very well in this game. Uh, he played knight f5, and uh, they got to this position. Magnus didn't see anything better than trading the knights. Uh, it would be interesting to look at. Also, I'm sure he considered playing something like bishop d3 with the idea, sort of a slow. You know, a slow plan of queen c2 and knight d2. But maybe he didn't like bishop g4 here, which is this pin can be a little bit annoying. Um, you could consider h3. You know, sometimes that's playable too. Um, a slower buildup. I was a little bit surprised to see the trade of... Uh, the, the double trade of knights because it seems like uh, black is not too far from equality here. Uh, 
And Hikaru played the, this part very well. Managed to uh, find his strong move, Rook A3. And uh, now he played Rook B3. Afterwards, you know, in the interview, uh, Hikaru was saying maybe Rook A4 would have been more precise with the idea that after B5, Queen B4, he's attacking D4 pawn. But it's hard to fault him for, for his play. Uh, and he does manage to... Um, to neutralize this position after bishop d1 it looks a little bit dangerous for black but he plays bishop d3 with the idea to play bishop uh, b5 uh dr sausage is asking any idea why why magnus doesn't try out hikaru's queen's gambit declined um well it's a good question i mean i think we we have been expecting everyone to kind of try out uh hikaru's queen's gambit declined but uh at the same time you know even though it, it always seems like the the Positions are better for white. Uh, Hikaru has managed to hold out, you know, and recently against Aronian, uh, he actually won a game and uh, he's done quite all right with it. So I think it's one of these things where the computer always tends to give white an edge, like plus 0 0.7, plus 0 0.8, which is generally better than what you get in almost any openings. But maybe Magnus feels that in reality, uh, you know, Hikaru can hold these, especially in this time control. So, but I don't have an answer. Magnus is a... Uh, Obviously, uh, uh, extremely strong in the opening, and uh, he's decided to go for this for for these e4, e5 lines instead of d4. Might just be you know a matter of wanting to try something different uh, instead of continuing to repeat the same uh, the same bishop f4 line. I I, just, I, I wouldn't say that it's uh, impossible that Magnus tries the the, the bishop f4 line tomorrow. Um, so this ending, Hikaru manages to hold, and it's it's actually quite instructive what he does here, um, in the position that they get. I will I will get it here. Um, so Magnus is trying to to make his pass pawn matter, but this actually I wanted to point out this maneuver here. Uh, Hikaru sees this coming with bishop f5, and he finds this nice nice maneuver of bringing the bishop to c3, from which the bishop is actually sort of untouchable, and then he has this active plan of playing c5, and this assures him a draw. Um, we'll see here how he does it, but even though this is a this looks looks a little bit dangerous, right? You're letting the pawn be taken. Uh, however, he's correctly assessed here that he's got the move g6, forces the bishop back. And then g5, which uh, now he's threatening to play d4, and he's also threatening to win the pawn back. So bishop f5 back, d4. And now after the bishop moves, bishop to b4. And so well calculated. And Hikaru is very good at, at calculating his way uh, out of these you know, end, end games. And so here, black is taking this pawn. And even though this, sorry, my, uh, my mouse is making crazy arrows here. Um, so let's say we play, I mean, it's, 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 fairly, it's fairly simple here, but if we play like king f3, bishop c5, um, it's clear that black doesn't have any problems anymore. For example, king e4, we can play bishop c6, and everything will get simplified here. We'll eventually get this pawn, white will get that one, and uh, so we'll have a, a draw. Um, which, you know, you could, you could draw the pawn ending here uh, with black. This is a draw. Um, because you keep the opposition. Uh, actually, yeah, I don't think you even need the opposition position here. Even if you know you made a move that loses the opposition, it would still be still be a draw here. So there's no there's really no uh, no way th for this position to be lost. Uh, H5, for example. So even if you lose this pawn, it still is a draw. So yeah, Fuchsia says always blame the mouse. Uh, I don't blame the mouse for any of my losses, even though. Um, even though I have a lot of losses, uh, but for the arrows, the arrows, sometimes they do funny things with the right, the right click. Um, so yeah, solid match from Hikaru who, you know, after, uh, after being in trouble in the, in the first game managed to turn that around and then he just managed to neutralize Magnus and it's not, it's not easy to neutralize Magnus. Uh, and, uh, he did it, you know, reasonably convincingly. So if we go back now to our, um, Let's go back to our bracket here. Um, as you can see, let me remove the thing in the background here. As you can see, uh, Hikaru and Magnus tied 1-1. They are playing tomorrow, same you know, same bat time, same bat channel. It's, it's uh, 10 o'clock Eastern, uh, 4 o'clock Central European summertime. Um, and so we will have one match, a very exciting one that is uh, 
you know, I, I do wonder I do wonder what openings they're going to play, actually. I, I'm particularly curious about what Magnus chooses with white. Does he revert to d4 and go after these closed positions in the Queen's Gambit that Hikaru has seemed to get tough positions in? Um, or is he going to go back to, uh, to playing e4 and go for these sort of offbeat lines? Or is he going to go against Hikaru's Berlin? Uh, the funny thing about the Berlin is Magnus has been playing it with black. So... <clears throat> we could see four Berlins, which uh, doesn't tend to make people happy, but but who knows? Uh, these Berlin lines with uh, with with Bishop C5, Bishop takes C6. I don't mind them. They're not uh, they're not like the the uh, end day, end game that everyone's playing for years in the Berlin. So they're they're fairly interesting. So uh, should be a lot of fun chess tomorrow. Uh, meanwhile, Dubov gets to rest. He's got a couple days, right? Because we have a free day, I believe, after the, the semifinal ends. So Dubov has two days to uh, find more ways to play h4 and g4 in the opening and uh, get ready you know, get ready for the final, whether it's against Magnus or against Hikaru. Uh, maybe he'll just rest. And uh, in the meantime, you know, thanks, for, thanks for tuning in uh, with me today. And I will see you all tomorrow for an after show when we will finally know who the two finalists for the Lindors Abbey Rapid Challenge will be. Um, so thank you everyone for tuning in. Enjoy your Friday evening and I will see you all tomorrow.